Alan Hirsch Advisors, creating aha moments, presents Aha Business Podcasts. We provide opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. For more information, log on to alanhirschadvisors.com. I'm your host, Alan Hirsch. Hey, welcome to today's podcast. My guest is uh, Sam Rucklewitz. I hope I get that right. Uh, uh, Vice President of Digital Strategy and Data Analysis of uh, Warshawski. Uh, it's very complicated with these names, so I hope I get them right during this podcast. If I don't, it's my apologies to both you and uh, Warshawski. You've did, done marvelously so far. <laughs> okay. So what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Well, I mean, I think a big part of that is helping our clients do better. One of the things that we really take pride on is helping each of our clients achieve their business goals, not just getting some marketing results, not just sending over another report. It's really like understanding clients' business and helping them make it even better. So for the last six months, that's been a nonstop motivator because we have a lot of clients that have been forced by the current situation to really reinvent their business and really figure out how do we make this work in a very, very different world. And it's been, it's been a challenge. I love a challenge, so. Okay. so. I mean, you do, you do digital strategy and data. So how did you do it with somebody? I mean, stories are great. Our listeners love stories. But how do you d approach, you know, this, this pandemic and take a client, you know, transforming them to a success when they could have been a failure during this five-month period? I mean, a lot of it starts with, going back and really understanding what their current business model is. And some of them, we had to fundamentally work with them to change it. So we've had some clients that are like in the event space, for instance, well, events aren't happening. Events aren't going to happen this fall. Uh, they're probably not going to happen next spring. So we had to go back with the client. We worked together with them and their executive leadership. And we figured out, okay, how do we do this? Do we do a virtual conference? Okay. What does that look like? How do we charge for it? How do we price for it? How do we acquire customers profitably for it? Okay. Before we make that investment, Let's, let's try some webinars. We did that and ended up getting them with some webinars, got people to sign up and register for them, got people to pay for them. And then now we're going towards virtual conferencing, which is a different challenge, but then you know, we're able to help them start to monetize that, bring in registrations online, use the infrastructure that they have that could be repurposed to serve what they're currently doing. And then you know, also, unfortunately, you know, some of the, the, the stuff they had in place, well, Got to go because we're not doing in-person conferences right now. So you don't be a little uh, bit leaner. Yeah. You know, for, for retailers, it's a question of, okay, well, which retailers have the infrastructure to sell online? Does that infrastructure make sense for you? You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, everyone talks about e-commerce, but e-commerce comes in like 17 different flavors. It's like you're going into Ben and Jerry's, right? You got to find the one that's right for you. So for some of those retailers, it's, it's Amazon and Amazon is a go-to channel and we're doing really well there. For other retailers, I mean, whose business model doesn't support it, you know, it's about let's build you a, let's figure out the right platform for you to own your own data and to own your own customer. And that might be Shopify, that might be WooCommerce, that might be something completely different. And it's really working with them to understand, okay, what margins do we need to hit? What data do we need to capture? What do we actually need to be able to provide and deliver to customers? What do we have the budget to do? Do we have the budget to get those customers or no? Because some clients, as I'm sure you know, Alan, there's some businesses are really struggling and they don't have the money. So, right. you know, maybe it does, <clears throat> maybe in an ideal world. And we have some clients that are like this now where it's like, you know what? We can't do what we want to do. We can't do perfect because we don't have the budget. But what we can do is start to get money in the door via online sales, via Amazon. We know we don't love Amazon forever. We know we don't want to do web with Amazon forever because... They have oppressive data, data policies. They don't give us customer data. We can't build a relationship. It's overly commoditized. Pricing is a pain. Amazon steals some copies your products. All things people know. But that being said, cash today is good. So right. let's start on Amazon. Let's get a proof of concept and let's use that and say, okay, what's our plan for six months, one year, two years? And that plan is, you know, today we start on Amazon. We get some orders in the door. Six months from now, once we've gotten enough money saved and we're we're in a good position. We're going to start aggressively promoting on Amazon and use it as a testing facility. Okay, great. While we're doing that, we're going to start to build our own online store 
And we're gonna start to populate that with some new products and use that as our primary delivery channel. And we're gonna start to you know, equalize our pricing across these two. And then for the, the next year after that, we're gonna start to really promote our own store. We're gonna pull the money off of Amazon, start to promote ourselves. And then hopefully the goal is in two years, our store is self-sustaining. Yeah, well, I, I had a client that had a store in, a, in uh, the uh, BWI airport. Uh, you know, a one small store that was the only place she was selling product. Yeah, I mean, in cases like that, you have to move online like overnight. Well, fortunately, and she collected email addresses from all of her customers. Very smart. So she oh. went, she created an email site, uh, an e-commerce site right away. Yeah. Uh, and what she didn't realize was these who stopped by uh, the, the uh, small shop in the airport uh, were passerbys. They were, you know, and she custom made her stuff. Well, now she's getting reorders and reorders when she got one or two orders. And she's making more money now than she ever did in the retail store. Yeah, I think there's a lot of businesses that are finding that out, that you can make a lot of money. Um, and honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a very different, but it's also a simpler business model in some cases. Yeah. Well, restaurants are the same way. You know, they had yeah. to, they had to transform themselves and some did and some didn't. Yeah. And that's, that's been the kind of the story of the pandemic is it's very much an evolve or die kind of a world that we're in right now. Yeah. And there's been a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs that have been able to build fantastic businesses during this time because they've met that need and they've helped entrepreneur help other entrepreneurs get the functionality they need. Like when you see it from the Shopify app store where there's like thousands of new plugins that have just been created as people realize like, we don't have a way to do this. If somebody starts it, it goes off. But then, I mean, by the same token, there's a lot of businesses that have failed, um, sadly, but. Yeah, I mean, uh, some businesses don't, you know, let me put it this way. Uh, Mark Twain said the definition of insanity is someone that's trying to do the same thing, does the same thing over and over again and expects different results. Yeah, you got that one right. <laughs> uh, and during this pandemic, you've had to rethink, everyone's had to rethink of what they were doing and how to do it. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's not just the pandemic though, it's also like we've seen a lot of brands that have been impacted in some way or another by the current social justice and the current um, racism epidemic that has come to light, you know, where a previously reliable channel like Facebook is now being boycotted and where you're selling online, but the primary way in which you sell online, Facebook and Instagram is now being undermined or you're continuing to be there has brought up some brand reputation questions, which is, another challenge right uh, so what are, so so what do you do by with some of these challenges so i mean for some of them it's honestly when some of the big brands pull out it's actually great for some of the challenger brands that don't mind uh, a little bit of you know a little bit of physical play so to speak you know a little bit of okay because as those big brands pull out i mean you have a it's a real-time bidding system so as competition decreases, ad prices decrease. And we've seen on some of these platforms that, you know, you'll see CPMs two, three dollars. And for a small brand that's looking to make an impact that has a good product, that has strong product market fit, that knows what they're doing, when those prices go that low, you know, you're seeing a money printing machine. You know, yeah. every dollar you put in is ten, fifteen dollars in top line out after you net out your costs. You're still every dollar you put in, you're still bringing out four, five, six dollars, which is it's a trade most of us would take any day. Uh, yes, assuming the cost of product was right. Since it was uh, reasonable. Right, but I'm, I'm saying even for some of our clients, it's after, after you net out your cogs, after you net out everything else, you're still at five or six. Right. Crazy. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that part's good. And then for some where it, it, it's not tenable for whatever reason, we've gone to alternative channels. So, you know, we've started with some Snap advertising. We've looked at TikTok advertising. We've diversified over to Microsoft. Um, we've done Twitter ads, YouTube ads, YouTube TV, programmatic display. There's lots of tactics out there. And it's basically, you gotta, 
you have to zig when everybody else zags. If, ever, if you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're going to get the results that everybody else is getting. But if you want outsized results and you want outsized returns, then you have to go where people aren't going. Yeah. Clients are comfortable with that. Other uh, clients, not so much. Right. So tell me more about your agency, what the agency does, uh, uh, because all we've been talking about is, is digital strategy uh, uh, and data analysis. We've really not even talked about some of the data and how you use that to predict what you're doing. Sure. Well, let's start with the agency part. So okay. Warshawski is a global boutique digital communications agency. We're headquartered in Baltimore. We have offices in New York and DC. We've been around for about 23 years now. Uh, we're founder owned and founder led. David Warshawski, our CEO, founded the agency back in 1996 um, and continues to be CEO to, to this day, continues to be actively involved to this day. Um, so it's been fantastic. Um, that's, it's honestly great to have a, to be independent and not owned by like a hold co during these times, because, you know, we do have the, the stability and the financial freedom to continue to invest in our clients and in our agency. A lot of my colleagues that have hold co's aren't exactly in that, <laughs> right? yeah. don't have that luxury right now. They're, and, they're cutting and, and, staff, they're cutting budgets and it's, and they're subject to the whim of the owners. Correct. And when those, when those owners are a big faceless international corporation that's profit at all costs, the first thing that goes are um, staff training, client service, and, and really innovation is what yeah, well, cut first. One of the biggest things I see getting cut is marketing. Yes. Marketing budgets, yes. Which, is, yes. which is crazy. But that's in every recession, large companies cut, cut advertising. And I mean, honestly, part of me, I have this uh, talk that I do every year, um, but part of me thinks that this is marketing's fault. This is the fault. Agencies have no one to blame but themselves when you get cut. And the reason you get cut, my background's in finance. I, that's what I did. But the reason you get cut is because you never communicated what you did and what value you brought in a way that makes sense outside of marketing. Marketing has always had this attitude like we're just valuable. You should just love us. We just do this. But they've never actually brought the, done the hard work of bringing the data to the table and saying, no, 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 You gave me this budget and this is what I provided for you. This is the value that you got in return. Everyone loves to throw on this ROI of like 13 clicks. Who cares? How much money did you bring in? How many new customers did you bring in? How many customers did you save? Most agencies don't speak that language. And when you don't speak that language, you get cut because you're a cost center. You're not a profit center. So if marketing agencies don't want their budgets cut, then I would suggest getting better about business instead of better about marketing metrics. Well, okay, I think- I so I, for that. Well, no, that's fine. I think you're right on that. Uh, and it's a great time to take a break. And when we come back, uh, uh, I will continue the conversation with Sam uh, Ruckelwitz, uh, VP of Warshawski. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Podcast. Hi, Rick Dempsey here. As a former Oriole and Series MVP, I know a lot about winning and championship teams. Today, I'm happy to tell you about my award-winning web design and internet marketing team, Adventure Web Interactive. For over two decades, many of Maryland's most successful firms have chosen Adventure Web as their strategic partner for web design and online marketing. I can tell you from using them personally, their search engine optimization and social media programs have saved their clients tens of thousands over the traditional pay-per-click digital agency. Visit AdventureWebInteractive.com and listen to what clients such as Hercules Fence, TriStar Electric, ABC Rental, Rhine Landscaping, Markdown's Office Furniture, and many more highly successful firms have to say. And don't forget to tell them Rick Dempsey sent you.
Strengthen, protect, and preserve your retirement nest egg. Scott Garceau here for the Stephen J. Sless Group, Baltimore's reverse mortgage specialist. Reverse mortgages have evolved to become a viable retirement tool. Enjoy retirement without monthly mortgage payments, improve cash flow, pay off debt, and stretch retirement savings. Stephen and his team can offer strategies to make housing wealth work for you. If you're 62 or older, learn if a reverse mortgage could help. Visit ReverseBaltimore.com. An equal housing opportunity lender. This is not a commitment to last. Stephen J. Sless, NMLS 298581. PRMI, NMLS 3094. Uh, welcome back to the show. My guest is Sam Ruckelwitz, uh, Vice President of Digital Strategy and Data Analysis of Warshawski. Uh, welcome back, uh, Sam. Uh, we've been talking about you and data analysis, and you began to talk about Warshawski and the value of marketing and how you evaluate it for a company. So, is there a little bit more that you can talk about in that area? Sure. So we have a, I'll take a step back and say, you know, my background's in finance. So what I always look at is everything through that lens, because at the end of the day, that's money is what keeps an organization alive. So when we have a new client, we build budget models for each one of those clients. And part of that budget model is an analysis of what each outcome is worth to your business, not, what a click is because you don't care. I've yet to meet the CEO who cares about likes or follows, but I have, n- I have never met the CEO that doesn't care about profitability, sales velocity, deal flow, um, you know, net profit per customer, et cetera, right? So what we do is we work with the client at the very beginning. We say, all right, what are the outcomes we're trying to generate? Whether that's a lead form for a business, whether that's a, an inbound inquiry for you know, maybe a, a business to consumer product, like a, uh, we have like home services, for instance, right? That's just an inquiry, right? What's that worth to you? Okay. And then for, for consumer products, it's all about, let's not just do a top line revenue because that's, that's misleading. Let's go to profitability. You know, for each product, what is, you know, what are your cogs? What are your margins? Let's go all the way down and say for each, you know, sale you make, how much money is actually going into your pocket? Because if we don't know that number, we can't do anything that's smart. So it starts with that. It starts with understanding the business, understanding the margins, understanding the outcomes. And then that goes into a budget model. And we say, all right, if we do this, here's the range of outcomes we can expect. And is this acceptable? Because I'm not a, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. I'd be a lot wealthier if I did. But what I can do is- Well, either you'd be a lot wealthier or a lot poorer because your crystal ball was either going to be right or wrong. If you're right, if you're right, you make more money. If you're wrong, you don't. That's true. So it's a fair point. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, we take that, we take it all, we put it into a budget model that projects a range of outcomes, runs, it basically uses a Monte Carlo approach with a Bayesian um, modeling system. So comes out and we give the client and goes, okay, here's what we think we should do. Here's each tactic. Here's the inputs that are going in. Here are the priors. And then we start to, we get alignment on that to make sure that when we do something, it's gonna actually move the business forward. The last thing you need to do is sell stuff at a loss. That's, I've seen just as many businesses go bankrupt as a result of success as they have a failure. Oh, absolutely. Because they're, all their money's in inventory and receivables. Yeah, I mean, I have, I've, I've seen some clients that I swear to you, every sale they were making, they were, their agency was proudly touting a return on ad spend of two, they were incredibly happy with this profitable spend, but the COGS were 62% of revenue. So you're paying 62% on your to get the product and you're paying 50% on your advertising cost. That's 112%. You're losing 12% of your top line every time you make a sale. That's crazy, but nobody ever did the homework. So the first part of our business, of our approach is always let's, understand your business, let's understand what outcomes are worth. And if you're not sure, let's work with you to value them conservatively so that we're not doing that. Then let's take that data, we'll put it into a budget model and we'll come out with a series of outcomes for each channel that allow us to evaluate if we're on track or off track. So now we have, we have alignment, we have clear deliverables, we have clear metrics, KPIs that allow us to tell us if we're on track to hit those goals and expectations that you've set for us. And, you know, we're able to see in real time, is that making a difference or not? Are we helping you or not? 
And if we're not, then how do we fix it? But that, this avoids that situation that every business owner dreads where you're doing marketing and you come back six months later to find out it didn't do a damn thing. That's not acceptable. And it shouldn't be the case, but hey, I don't run the world, so it, it is. Yeah. So, so, so you work from a profitability instead of a, uh, uh, a uh, cost per client, I guess. Right. Yeah. It, you have to work from a profitability standpoint. Um, we do, we work with clients on retainer, but that's all baked into the budget model. So we, you have to account for the agency costs when you're doing projections. You have to, because it's a cost of the business. But I would say that we work from a business outcomes perspective first. Marketing is just a way to help the business get to where it needs to go. So when you realize that and take a step back and say, okay, what, what's healthy for the business? What do they need to do? Then you can be a much more valuable advisor and you can get much closer to people in profit. Because now we're not just the marketing people over in the corner doing stuff, reporting back clicks and, and likes and social follows and engagement and all this other garbage. We're a valued part of the team that's saying, hey, if we want to get to X, Here's how we can do it. Here's a pathway. Here's the confidence level we have that we're going to do it if you invest this. And here, if we hit that target, is how much your return will be based on the numbers that you gave us. Now you're a business advisor who just happens to know the marketing stuff. You're not a marketing person that happens to be doing business. And when you're, when you're in that former position, I think it's a position of strength, especially during times like this, because clients are coming to you hoping to help reinvent their business and it's really difficult to reinvent something you don't understand in the first place. Well, that's always, tr always true. You have to do your, your homework and evaluate what you have and then where you want to go. Yep. 100%. And, then, and put the, put the marketing in place to get you where you want to go. Yep. And, and what is that cost mm -hmm. attributed to what you want? Exactly. Which is exactly what the approach is designed to do. So it, it I think it, it helps create alignment among all stakeholders as cliche and of a word as that is, but it also, it, it provides a much greater level of transparency so that you can properly attribute credit to where it's due or not. So how does all of this fit into a holistic and integrated approach to working with your clients? It's a good question. Um, I think when you have the foundation that we just talked about, and uh, the advantage of Warshawski, the thing that I really do appreciate about the agency is we're tactic neutral. We don't particular, we don't have a bias. We're not an advertising agency because when you're an advertising agency, the solution you have to every problem is advertising. When you're a creative agency, the solution you have to every problem is creative. When you're a digital agency, the problem you have to every solution is digital stuff. We're not a PR, right? So when you're, you have all these services, you offer them under one roof, and we do it in a way with a blended rate. So the, the cost to us and the value to us is the same, which means that we come at it and we build, we start with our foundation of your business and then we look and say, okay, hey, what's gonna move the needle the most for you? Because to me, it doesn't matter. I don't, if that answer happens to be digital advertising, great, fantastic. If it happens to be PR, great, fantastic. If it happens to be some combination of creative, digital, and some out of home advertising, which has actually worked for some clients, put on unique URLs and everything, and it works great. Don't care. Because it's at the end of the day, it's about understanding your business and doing what's best for it. And I have no incentive to do anything other than that. How do you go about communicating this and working with your clients to make them understand it? It's always a challenge. Um, I think we do business in a very different way than most agencies is what I found, which is. Well, you, you explained it. Right. Most agencies, they're, they're an advertising digital. They want to sell their advertising. They want to sell their digital, which is why it gets cut because there's no profitability involved in it. It's a, it's right. a, a cost center. It's not a income center. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's, it's educating clients that that doesn't have to be the way it is, number one. And number two, that, and one of the things that we've done really well, I think, is we've cut out a lot of the fat that you see on a lot of other agencies. We have a really lean structure and we empower people to, to do things really, we hire subject matter experts and we empower them to do what they do best. 
we cut out the traffickers, we cut out the middlemen, we cut out the client relationship managers. All that stuff is what drives prices high and at the cost of the client. So what we said is, you know what, let's, let's just hire great people, hire senior level folks, and we'll pay them really well to work here. And we're going to empower them to do what they think, what, what they do, right? There's no point in hiring smart people if you're going to tell them what to do. You hire smart people and you empower them to be smart. So that's what we do. Um, but for a lot of clients, that's sometimes it's a bit of a question mark, like, oh, there's this small little agency in Baltimore of all places, and they're doing work with these huge global brands. I don't understand. And the answer is, well, we hired fantastic people and we empower them. And we're able to do with a small team what some agencies do with a team of 50 or 100. And I think it's a result of being structured, but training some big legacy clients to think that a small little, a smaller agency can compete with the big boys is, is tough. But this pandemic has actually been a great equalizer for us because at the end of, you see a lot of big clients, especially ones that we have now that are coming back and they're saying, you guys, for what we're, what we're paying you are doing the work of we're paying another agency much more for and you're doing it better and we didn't think that was possible but now we do and now that our budget's under siege we really appreciate this so the, you have nine or your website shows i think it's nine ways that you work with people what are they and and how do you go about making sure that you do it with every client so are you talking about engagement structures? Or are we talking about um, like services offered? Uh, I think it's more engagement that you're talking about here rather than services. Uh, you know, you offer superlative personal attention is one of the- Oh, gotcha, gotcha, okay. okay. So uh, I think when David founded this agency, he was a big agency guy. He worked at Edelman, he worked at Dylan Schneider, and he saw the way that they interacted with clients and it didn't sit well with him. And one of the things that I really appreciate is he's like, you know what? I'm not just gonna sit here and be a cog of the machine. I'm gonna do it my way. So he did. And I think one of the, the big challenges we always saw is that you have these big accounts and it, it always gets me because I work with a lot of these people and I'm it just, it drives me mad. Um, is, you know, you, you have these accounts and there's the junior person on them. They're sold by the senior level person with a flashy deck and this and that. And then, magically that 35 year old industry veteran decorated who you think you're going to work with magically turns like you know cinderella with a pumpkin into a 23 year old who's never done this before and all of a sudden you're as a client you're sitting there thinking what, what happened you know they promised me this and i got that that's not good and one of the things that we do is again it's part of the the, the deliberate structure and the deliberate hiring process is we don't do that the people that are that in, that are involved in the new business pitch are the people that work in the account. We don't have a new business person. We don't have a sales team that's gonna sell you. And that's how you can deliver that personal attention because you build the relationship from day one. That's how you ensure that nothing gets dropped because the people that were there from the first meeting are there from the rest of the time. You meet the people that are actually gonna work with you. You can build that relationship, right? Um, we are a business focused group. Right? We don't care about the flashy marketing metrics or the flashy design awards. We care about getting you something right for your business, which is reflected in how we work with you. Like for example, I have yet to meet another agency that really builds a budget model for clients. But we do because not because we think it's a differentiator for us, but because that's how we can make sure that we get the client what they need. Um, you know, we obviously, we go above and beyond for so many of our clients because we really truly care about them like you get to know somebody like that you get to work with somebody every day you're talking on the phone you understand their business you understand who they are you can't help but feel for them you can't help but you know see yourself as a part of that team and we only work with clients that want that kind of partnership we've said no to lots of clients who wanted us to be a fulfillment agency or wanted us to do that or do this it's not how we work it's not what our team wants it's not what they signed up for and it's not how we're gonna be most effective so we don't work with them. So, so you, you pick and choose who you want to work with as well. Yeah, hundred percent. You have to, any healthy business, I think has to be willing to say no, because oh. if, and to me, honestly, the clients that you say no to are the ones that feel the best 
because you can just, you sit there and you're like, you know what, this isn't going to be a good relationship for us. It's not going to be healthy for my team. It's not going to be healthy for you. No one's going to be happy. No one's going to walk away good from this. So let's just not do it. Mm -hmm. No, I, under I understand. It's, uh, uh, I took one company that was doing $9 million and making fairly little profit back to $6 million and was making uh, half a million dollars worth of profit. See, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Because the company, the, the, the three million dollars was losing money. Yeah, they never, it's, they never fired an account. You gotta, you have you to. Gotta, do you have to do it. You have to look critically at your business, and you have to understand, you know, what's good for. And it's not just about the money; it's also about the people. Right. Like we really, truly value every member of our team. We're a small team, you know, relative to other agencies that are three, four hundred people. We're twenty-five, and every one of them. They're wonderful to go to work with every day. It's great. It's exciting to work with them because they're great at what they do and they're happy and they're passionate about doing it. But mm -hmm. the second you start making them do things or asking them to work on accounts that they're not, that, you know, that don't treat them like a professional, that don't respect them, that want to treat them like an order taker instead of a, a valued partner, it's not good for your team. No, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. I mean, uh, you need to be shown appreciation, whether it's from your own business or from your customers. When you're working with a team, uh, yeah. as, as uh, 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 one of my other podcasts, uh, the, the biggest challenge is the appreciation, the success that the individual has and is recognized by the management and we superiors and, and by the customer. Yes. You know, I, I think one of the things that we, that Warshawski does fantastically well, and I credit David and our COO, Shana, who I think you, we, you met back when you visited our office yeah. a couple years back. Right. I mean, they, we all try to go above and beyond to recognize the team members that do that. And, you know, during this pandemic, just as a quick example, like Shana sent everybody, didn't ask anybody, just, just did it. She sent everyone like a little small treat of something that they enjoy because she takes notes on what everybody likes, you know, and it's just a little thing that says, you know, thank you so much for, for doing all this, for being flexible. Well, yeah. I mean, your, your firm worked, uh, uh, most people worked in an office. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. are you transforming where you're going to be working uh, remotely uh, in the future? You know, yeah. these, are, these, these are things you have to think about. Yeah. It's, are, you yeah. Gonna, are you going to need all of the space you have at corporate headquarters? I mean, oh, for your on yeah. your own, you have to think about this. Yeah, I mean, we kind of bought it, so it's kind of hard to hear. But uh, yeah, it was kind of unfortunate timing that just as our our new building came online fully, this this situation hit. But you know, we've we've adapted. The whole team has gotten great at working remotely. I think where our productivity levels, um, by every measure we have, are at or above where they were before. Um. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yeah. But what, see, it doesn't matter. Yeah. What, what matters is, are you getting your work done? Is the client getting what they need? Are you hitting the goals that we've set for you and that you've set for yourself? If so, okay. Well, this has been a great conversation, Sam. So I really appreciate you. Uh, so how can uh, listeners reach you and your firm? Sure. So the easiest way to reach Warshawski is on the internet. Our website is warshawski.com. Uh, you want to you spell, spell it? Yes, yeah, so <laughs> spell that. It's W-A-R-S-C-H-A-W-S-K-I. And I promise you we're the only result for that in Google. Uh, <laughs> so once you get the spelling close to right, you should be fine. Um, we are active on just about every social channel. So if you ever want to reach out, we're under W agency for most social channels. Um, it makes it a little bit easier. If you want to reach me, the best place is either LinkedIn or Twitter. On Twitter, it's at Digital Sam I Am. Um, I love Twitter just because I apparently, I don't know, I'm just a weird person. Well, uh, it's something you enjoy. Right. So, so you use it. Correct. And email is sam at warshawski.com. Well, thank you again very much for being on the podcast. Uh, and I, I uh, wish you luck and uh, we'll stay in touch. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, your host. Reach me, uh, visit my website, www.alanhirschadvisors.com. You can listen to the podcast uh, where you get your podcast or within a couple of weeks, uh, 
it will be on YouTube as well. So, uh, uh, and I'm Alan Hirsch, and this has been AHA Business Podcast. <laughs>